part of the call for this generation is to be mountain movers. You have to see that not just as a hobby or something um, that's cute to say. Um, every generation, every person is brought to the kingdom for such a time. That means the fact that you're in the kingdom, and by the way, more people are running into the kingdom every day at unprecedented numbers, not just in other nations, in this nation. People are running in, in, into the house of God and into the things of God and, and getting their relationship with God together because he's sending out a call. And he's calling them. And if you're not in the right place with God, I need you to hear it real loud and clear. He's talking to you because he's calling people. But part of the call of this generation, and what I mean by that, is everybody who's alive at the same time, at any given time, is a part of the Lord's generation. The Lord's generation is made up of numbers of earthly generations. You understand? One generation shall praise thy works unto another. And so everyone who's alive at the same time is the Lord's generation. And the Lord's generation consists of of younger teaching older and uh, as, as the younger let no men despise your youth as the older don't think that you that, that you know that, that it's over for you because old men dream dreams and young men see visions and servants and handmaidens and it has to be everybody working together the, the, the Lord's generation is a lot like the holy ethnic group you are a holy nation the word nation is the word ethnos and we know that uh, as, as it relates, just as it does in age, in age we have ages and stages, all of those things. And as, as it relates to ethnic groups, we are, we are many races. We are many ethnic groups. You, you are in the right skin color. You are in the right gender. You're in the right time. And the Bible says, and then he has called us out of every tribe, every kindred, and every tongue, and has made to us, made us to be a holy ethnic group and so it doesn't mean that we are ignorant of the ethnic groups that that we live in but but our citizenship is the kingdom of heaven and so anyway so that's how the Lord's generation and the holy ethnic group uh, works that we are all joined together and there is a generation that's in the earth right now that is called to be mountain movers problem solvers world shakers game changers newsmakers and um and and I, and I believe this is important because there are there are kinds of mountains there are mental mountains there are money mountains and there are multitude mountains and what i mean by that is mental mountains some of the things that have to be moved in our time for the greatest move of god to ever happen to happen is we have to get some of the mountains that are in our mind moved out of the way because you can limit God by the way that you think. If you believe something is not, is not possible, then it will not happen. All things are possible to him that believes. And just in case you don't know, if, if, if a person has a mental mountain, God will just jump over you and do it through somebody else so there has to be there has to be uh, mountain movers by which we understand that God doesn't always do what he does in an orthodox way most move of God's don't look like you think they're gonna look and and many times the very people praying for the move of God miss it because they don't like the way God did it but I promise you God ain't stressing you he is not sweating that not one bit. Albert Einstein had a, uh, a saying uh, that, that the significant problems that we face cannot be solved on the same level that we were at when we created them. And sometimes uh, for, for a problem to be solved, you have to get to another level of thinking. This applies to the church because... Um, for, for generations in, in our nation, um, churches moved on the momentum of being accepted easily and being surrounded by a culture that reinforced your faith. 
When your kids went to school, they taught them some Bible verses. They gave them times of prayer. There were uh, at least uh, moral things at some degrees on television. And, and even if people didn't go to church, um, they, they supported you for going. Most, most people uh, of any age in this building went to uh, 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 Sunday school, um, went to uh, vacation Bible school, learned, learned uh, uh, memory verses, and, um, and somewhere over time, somewhere over time, then there, the principalities and powers produce a hostility in the air that that almost begins to make it seem like there's something wrong with you or there's something outdated with you or that you're not up to speed or you're out of date or you're passe. I'm looking for a word that'll help you. I'm, th 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 that because, because you are a for real Christian. I'm not talking about checking a box Christian. I'm talking about a for real Christian. There were days and hours in this nation when you would not be able to be elected into an office if you could not state what church you were a member of. Because being a member of a local church spoke something as to your character and that you had people around you that could vouch for you and to say, oh, they've been a long time member here. And, and so... And so th that produces into uh, the minds of people um, mental mountains. And so then the church began to retreat. Church began to retreat and begin to say, well, let's just try to hang on. And so, um, so it produced mental mountains because many, many churchgoers, many people, rather than becoming mountain movers, became seat sitters. They were just kind of trying to hang on and survive. Jesus did not save you to put you in survival mode. He saved you to be a mountain mover and to tell those things to get out of the way. So, so one of the things that I'm seeing and sensing is a real, in, in a positive way, a real mental shift in the minds of God's people saying, no, we can do this thing. We can save our cities. We can solve some problems. We, we can see miracles. We can, we, can, we can do it. We're not backing up from it because we came to move some of these mountains out of the way. And the first mountains that need to be moved have to be moved out of our minds. So I'm not Albert Einstein, but I have a, a, a quote that I wrote in Power Shifters. Since I quoted Albert, I'm going to qu quote me. That... That the, the gateway to revelation is when you challenge the status quo. That's why I'm going to go after those three snakes in the garden on Thursday. is because there is a mentality by which people just accept the status quo. And anytime you try to break out of the status quo and do something that hasn't been done before, it makes you an easy target. And sometimes, sometimes people don't want you to succeed at what you're doing because the fact that you succeed at what you're doing means it's possible, which means their excuses no longer count. And when you keep trying to tell people why God can't, how God won't, why it can't be done, and then somebody comes along and does it, then you have to be quiet. But the mental... Mountains are moving and the multitude mountain is moving What I mean by the multitude mountain is that the multitude mountain has to do with who is in charge of the masses We have surrendered that for a generation or two to Hollywood entertainment sports right and we in, in uh, politics news channels all kinds of mass media and we, think, we say, well, they move the multitudes. I'm using the word multitudes because it keeps with my alliteration that I'm on. Makes it easier to remember. And so, but I think that when that mental mountain moves, 
And we realize we have the power to move multitudes into the direction of Jesus. When we really believe that. I said, when we really believe that. When we really believe that, then multitudes at a time are going to start coming to Jesus all over again. And we're already seeing signs of it because you know what God is doing? God is invading sports. God is invading Hollywood. God is invading Motown and music and entertainment. God is dropping his spirit on people because we get ready to move multitudes into the direction and letting everybody know Jesus is alive and well. Come on, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Are you ready for the, to see more people saved in your lifetime than any other generation has ever seen? And then uh, I was saying something about money mountains. Money mountains is because it's hard to move certain things if the church is talked into everybody uh, is, is supposed to remain broke or poor or fin financially struggling. There has to be some, some ability to move, to move money mountains. Half of the evil, I would say, at least half of the evil that's been done in the world is done not because someone had an idea, but because they were funded. And so, and so God, is, God is raising up all over the world. God is raising up in our midst. God is touching people and putting blessings upon them so that they understand that, that it's, not just, it's not just about getting some stuff. God doesn't mind you having stuff, as long as stuff doesn't have you, as long as you don't get attached to it. But it's not just about stuff. It's not just about stuff. It's about moving mountains. It's about moving mountains. There, there, there's really three little levels of impartation I want to give to you today. And because to be a mountain mover, you have to understand something um, about power. You have to understand something about power. I, I want to show you some, this is, like being, this is like being at the house when somebody come back from vacation. I wasn't on vacation, but I'm going to show you some slides. <laughs> Just to catch you up on, on what we were doing um, while I was in um, South Africa, partially so that you can see that mountains are moving. So... Um, I started off in Pretoria, and in Pretoria, I did an outdoor meeting. Israel Houghton went with me, was doing the music, and we did an outdoor meeting, and um, thousands of especially young people came, and uh, we preached to them in Pretoria, and at our conference this year, you probably saw Pastor David Grobler. He and his wife and team lead the Unite 180 church there, and um, we got out there on that piece of property um, they're, they're wanting to build a church building, and uh, they already have secured the, the property, and so I begin to have a, a word over them um, that about this time next year, we're going to be in a building right there in that place. We, we went from there to Johannesburg, and then in Johannesburg, we did a, another meeting, and uh, there was a first meeting uh, that we had done in Johannesburg, but as you can see, people were coming from everywhere, and um, so we preached and sang, and that, that, that meeting was a little different because they're not used to us, and it, it was many of them the first time uh, being in the room, so we did uh, interviews and television interviews and things like that to get people out there, and they came to it, and uh, they're learning as they go. We went from there to a very interesting place called a Apoch. I just call it Apoch because I can't say the whole name of it. And this place is um, it's on a college campus. The first year I went there, um, we did an outdoor meeting, and they usually have about 300 kids show up, and we had like 1,800. There's, this is them standing outside waiting to get into the building. And, and uh, these, these kids in Potch are at a university, and they, uh, they, they like to call themselves intellectuals and um, all that. And uh, so I, I gave him something, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> I gave him something, a little something to think about. Um, if you can just back up that one picture, thank you, is because that's the altar call. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I preached to them very directly on, on, uh, on Jesus and why everybody needs to be saved. And, um, and what, what was going on there. We, I don't even know how many young people came forward to get saved that night because, 
because we lost count of them. And they had to take chairs out of the front three rows. Anybody in the front three rows, pick up your chairs and move them to the side so we could get all these young people up there. And um, so once we had them up there and we prayed and, and, and the workers were getting contact information so that we could help work with them. And I said, now, since you're standing right here, let's just get you initiated properly. And uh, Israel came up and I said, well, you, let, we're going to teach you how to worship right here. And so then we led them in about, or he did, 40, 45 minutes of, of worship. And they were so, that's a good way to get started. That's a good way to, some of you would be better. And um, the, the anointing came in so strong, because I'm getting ready to t teach you about this. This is part of the impartation. I'm doing it already. So, so we're, we're in the service and the anointing came in so strong. All these young people came to the altar, and while the worship was going on, one of the young people's running a camera, and I'm standing over to the side, and he comes over to the side, and it looks to me like he's fixing to step off that step. So, because he can't, you know, he didn't know he's, he's going this way. And so I reached over to hold him up, and he fell out. <laughs> and so, the, so, so I was like, sorry. You know, I mean, I wasn't trying to do that. And then, uh, and then so, the, so the pastor, was coming to, to, um, to pick up the camera, and when the pastor walked over, then he fell out. <laughs> the anointing got so heavy up in that place until people just stayed away from me. And um, it, so that was, that was Potch, and uh, that was great. Then we went to Middleburg, and uh, that's Cornerstone Church, Middleburg. And the cool thing about this was they were celebrating their third, um, third church anniversary. Cornerstone Church in Middleburg, South Africa. And the young man and his wife there, um, Yaman, and his wife, um, Aisha, when he, he was he was set, he was a rugby player as well. And um, so he was set to, though to go to law school. And in the year 2000, which is almost right at 20 years ago, Israel Houghton and I went to Cape Town and had historic meetings in the Good Hope Center about 5,000 or so for a couple nights. And this young man was on his way to law school and his sister gave him a message that I preached in that service, or I think it was a, a, a VHS because he, he saw the music and then also heard the message. And he told me he went to his parents' vacation home, stuck it in and put it on a loop. And he said, I cried for two days. And he goes, I went home and told my parents, I'm not going to law school, God called me to preach. And um, so today we have Cornerstone. You can show a couple of the pictures there, please. So that's what Cornerstone Middleburg looks like right there. And so uh, we were able to help them celebrate on their, uh, on their third anniversary. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So then we went back to um, Cornerstone Pretoria. So we have Cornerstone Church uh, there in Pretoria. And um, we were there. And uh, they have just gotten into that kind of jam-packed, smaller building because Anton and his wife, Xanthi, started that church in their garage. And um, they just didn't have any place to go. They started in their garage, and every week I was checking on them. And about six months ago, I told them, it's time for y'all to come up out that garage. Amen. And he's like, well, we're not sure if we can do it. See, that's a mental mountain. And it's a money mountain. I mean, I understood what he was saying. He wasn't being unreasonable. But I told him, I said, you got to come up out that garage. Unless you want to be a bicycle, you need to come up out that garage. And uh, so they, so they found, but watch how God does a thing. They found, they found the building. And um, so last year when I was over there, I stood in that building. There was nothing there and just asked the, the church members to come so we could pray over the building. We didn't have a church service to pray over it so they could get a vision to see where we were at. This year they are in it. And then just, just before I got there, one week before, the house that they were in, that they were leasing, the, the owners of it had passed. It's a, it's a story. You know, the owners of it had passed, and their kids came back to reclaim it, and they had to get up out of that house in one week. Had they not came up out of that garage, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have any place to be. Thank God for Cornerstone Pretoria right there. He's doing an awesome job as well. <laughs> so, so then we had a down day or two, but then uh, Israel and I did something different this year. We did two what we called exclusive events at a lodge. So we have some friends over there that own a beautiful, beautiful lodge. Way out there, ain't that pretty? Yeah. See the sun shining, y'all? 
See that? See that? I don't see no snow. I don't see. That's a double rainbow. Double rainbow greeted us while we were there. There's a little giraffe. I was chasing it around on it one day. So uh, what we did in this, in this lodge here is we spent uh, a day and a half with pastors and worship leaders. They could come and stay and spend a day and a half with us. And then we had a, 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 another down day. And then another group came in of like 50. And we said, I don't know how many thousands of words we spoke to them because we spoke to them from 9 o'clock in the morning. I mean, we had food, you know, coming in until 10 o'clock that night talking to them about not, not about how do you put a sermon together, how do you write a song, about life management. How do you hear from God? How do you walk with the things? How do you move through seasons? How do you do this? And we talked and talked, and then in the evening, we built a big old fire out there. Israel led worship. I laid hands on people, and folks was falling out. Uh, one of them almost got barbecued. They fell out. I said, don't be falling into the fire. You look like, like somebody's going to roast you. And um, so, so we did that uh, for a few days, and so that was, that was the uh, trip to South Africa. And I just wanted you to know, because an apostolic church is a sending church, and um, I'm unable to, to fulfill that role um, unless everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. But thank God for that. Amen. So, so the, the, impartation, the impartation part of this, I'm, I'm imparting it to you because I want you, to, I want you to have a vision to move mental mountains. And to understand that we're moving multitudes all over the world and, and that we can move money mountains as well. Amen. So the first, I'm going to give you three things, okay? I'm just going to come out here and talk to you today. Everybody all right? Yeah. So um, the first one I want to talk to you about is power. Power. To move a mountain, you have to have some power. And um, Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm the kind of Christian that I like all other Christians mostly. And in the sense that everybody that's on the team is on the team. We need everybody on the team. I get, I get all that. Um, but but I, I do think that sometimes uh, people seem like they're afraid to talk about the power of the Holy Ghost. But it takes power to do something. Uh, the, the, the definition of power in the dictionary that I wrote is the, the ability of one to exercise their will over another. So, so when it comes to the things of the enemy, power is not a feeling. Authority is not a feeling. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven does not move based on feeling. It moves based on authority. And uh, authority kind of works like this. If you have young children and, um, and you have them in a playroom and they get a little bit rowdy, if some parent opens the door and sticks their head in that room, the presence of authority changes behavior. As long as, as, long as you're looking at them. As soon as you shut the door, they go back. But anyway, the, the, uh, so th this, this is power. Power comes. Power comes. You need power to live in today's world. And you, need, you have to have power to move a mountain. And, uh, and, and power comes at different levels and, and different times and different seasons. And so, um, you know, you, you remember me telling you the story. Many of you, I know, have heard about me receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When I, when I was a, a teenager. Y'all remember that? How many of y'all know that story? Yep. Okay, well, guess what? So this, one of the things I was doing this last year that, that I didn't talk about too much is that we're working on a documentary. And the documentary is, is going to be three segments. The first, the first segment of it is um, my story because we found out, you know, when you've been in the city for a long time, you think everybody knows your story. And um, I, was walk, I was walking through the hallway some time back, and uh, two boys were, uh, young boys were walking down the hallway, like 10, 11 years old, and, and the, one, the one boy, and I, I stopped, shook their hands, I said, glad y'all are here today, and the one boy said to the other boy, um, he's the bishop, and the other boy goes, cool, <laughs> and he realized 
they, they don't even know who, who we are. And then, and then uh, people were coming and, and didn't, didn't know. They wouldn't know what Bible school I went to and, and, or, you know, did, did my dad put me in as pastor or how long has the church been here? So we decided rather than just telling the story over and over, we work on a documentary and tell people how I got to where I am. And then the second part of it is going to be the Cornerstone Church story because people don't, some people don't know we started in a storefront. And, um, and then, the, then the third part of it is going to be Phil and Meredith's story. That way, whoever wants to catch up with us can just watch it on YouTube or Netflix or wherever, wherever we put it. Anyway, I said that to say, rather than tell you again about me getting the Holy Ghost, I'm going to show you a five-minute segment of a documentary reenacting at the same church in my hometown where I got the Holy Ghost and received the power. Here it is. Come on. One day, he was invited to an upcoming series of special revival services being held at the church. Well, I saw this he was a brawny lad, bony somewhat. Um, he was coming down the altar to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Say it. Amen. 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 The Holy Ghost is in this place. Yes, I said the Holy Ghost is yes. in this place. Yes. The power of God is in this place. Yes. Come on, somebody say yes. yes. And if you want the power of God to be in your life, Watching him going through the emotions of hold on, letting go, I knew that he did not understand what they were saying. They were shaking him this way, shaking him that way, and he let go, he let hold on, and I thought, oh, they're gonna kill him. They're gonna kill this little white boy. And as I stepped down the step, one by one. And I thought, I better make it quick, because if I go any slower, they're going to kill him. He's going to be laid out on the floor. So I thought, yes. So I just laid hands on him. Wasn't trying to be seen or anything, but he had to have it. And I just said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Let it come upon you. <laughs> and I took off running after that, and I never slowed down. And uh, so that's that's a that's part of that uh, that's part of the story there, and um, that's what that's when I started understanding the power of God, praying in the Holy Spirit, praying things that that um, that that your natural mind does not know when you don't know what to pray for as you should. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you will pray out for you, and then the, the power of God will be with you. You can do things with the with the Holy Spirit that you can't do by yourself. And um, so I, I, I wanted to tell you that part so I can get you to the next part, which is presence. If you're going to move mountains, you have to have presence. And I wanted to talk about that after power because it came to me this way. It came to me this way that when we were on, in the Burn Hill Plaza, and we might have had uh, maybe uh, 300 members at the time, and the, the power was operating. I, I remember particular Sundays of people being delivered and um, I remember one Sunday preaching so hard that, and, and the power of God was on me that a gentleman ran out into his car and got, got a bunch of uh, drugs out and stuff like that, came running and threw them on the altar. And then I cast the devil out of him and, and, he, and he started, he got saved and praying in tongues and became an usher and everything else like that. You know, it was, it was just, uh, we were seeing all kinds of, all kinds of things. Lady came in the service with a big neck brace on and um, she had been in a car accident. And I said, I can't tell you what to do, but if I was you, I'd snatch that thing off because Jesus is moving right here. And she took that thing and did like this and got and took off and ran around that church, did laps around the church. So I was, I was used to the power of God. Somebody shot power. power. I was used to the power of God. So, so the, the thing was, I would leave a service that was filled with power but I would still have sometimes an, uh, an unsettledness on the inside of me. 
I don't know how to define that to you exactly, except for it's, it's a funny thing to leave a great service, and, and it's like something trying to get my attention. And um, sometimes that's just God trying to talk to you. And, um, but, but I had just been in like that one zone of it. And so what I would do sometimes during that is I would walk around the parking lot and pray and talk and try to hear the, get the mind of God and feel what God was saying. And I was walking through the parking lot and I heard, I'll never forget it, never forget it. I heard God say to me, you have my power. He said, but you don't have my presence. He said, my power is there to back up my word. If you preach my word, my power will show up. He said, but my presence is reserved for my friends. And it wasn't a rebuke. I don't, I, you may take it that way, but, I, but God's voice has a tone to it. He wasn't trying to rebuke me. He was trying to teach me. <laughs> and so... And so I went on this thing of, of studying the presence of God. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to define that totally different, but I think everybody understands that, that, that there are things that work because they're principles. They, they work because it's, it's, the word is being preached. But the presence of God is, is, is kind of a, a weightier thing, you know? And um, so, so I started getting on this thing of what I call this radical commitment to the presence of God. That's what I called it in my own head. So I started reading in the, in the Bible where it would say, Jesus would say, I only do what I see my father do. I only, everybody say only. only. I only say what I hear my father say. And so I was reading about the pool of Bethesda and all them people there, and Jesus leaves all those people there and goes praise for one man. Don't you know the next week, we called for a prayer line, and the altar was filled. So I said, I'm having a conversation on the inside while stuff is happening on the outside. So on the inside, I'm telling God, I ain't praying for nobody until you tell me who to pray for. Okay. See, y'all don't like all that, do you? He's the one started it. He started it. So you telling me I don't have the presence, which I agreed with. You know, when God tells you something, it's like they, he shines so much light on you till there ain't no place to hide. And I'm trying to press into the presence. And the part that I'm at is I'm not doing anything without your guidance. And it's a whole lot of people up here. So who do you want me to pray for? So, you know, if you start playing with God, he's like, he just held up on me for a minute. Like, I'll get back with you. And um, so, so I, I end up praying for numbers of people. Well, it was odd to people, and I knew that, that I would pray for maybe four or five people and let everybody else go sit down. It didn't mean that they wouldn't get a miracle. It doesn't mean Jesus wouldn't touch them. It just meant he, he was teaching and leading me. Right. By the time we got to Airport Highway, I'm still on this thing. And the church is filled, and I'm up there preaching. True story. I'm up there preaching, and I hear God say to me, on the inside, if you'll stop preaching, people will get saved now. And um, I was coming to the best part <laughs> of my message. I was coming to the best part. I was, I, had, I, was, I was excited about it. You know, I could see the finish line. And I was ready to turn that corner. And I was so excited about where it was going. And I heard... God say to me, if you'll stop, people will get saved now. So me and God have this kind of relationship. I hope it doesn't, doesn't bother you at all, but, but he's good with me. I'm good with him. And so, so I just folded my Bible. Because that's my way of saying, okay, come on then. Because he said to me, I don't need you to do this. So I'm, I'm, so I'm doing two things. I'm like, okay, great. Boom. So let's find out. A, if I'm hearing right. No, y'all y'all are nervous. I'm not, either I'm hearing right or I'm not hearing right. If, if, if I manipulate the situation, then I'm responsible for the outcome. 
But if God says, if you'll stop, I'll get people saved now. So I just did like that. I just folded the Bible. And stood there and looked at the church. And a man about five rows back got up and walked to the altar. And when he walked to the altar, somebody over here got up and just walked to the altar. And then somebody else got up and walked to the altar. And by the time it was over, the altar was filled with people while I'm standing there watching God say, I know how to do this without you. Come on. What I'm trying to tell you is to move mountains, we have to have the presence of God. God told Moses, I'm going to take you into a land. Moses said, but, yeah, but if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. And when we come together, we have, to, we have to understand when we come together, it's because when we gather, he gathers with us. But if, but if you have to be sensitive to the presence of God. Watch this. Having faith, being able to hear God, and being able to feel God is a gift. You should not take it for granted. I said, you should not take it for granted. And I know we always have to work on our faith and we're always doing all of that. But the fact that you have faith is something you shouldn't take for granted. The fact that if you hear God, if you hear him closely, if you hear him barely, if you hear him sometimes, if you hear him anytime, the fact that he, he that hath an ear, let him hear. That means some people have ears, but they don't hear. And the ability to feel God, to know when he's in a room, to know when he's in a building, to know when he's in a moment, the ability to go, ooh, he, I don't care whether it's a goosebump or a hot flash or a cold chill. I don't care whether his hair standing up on your neck. I don't care if there's something moving in your belly. But when you can feel it, I said, when you can feel it, you ought to say hallelujah because I can feel it. I can feel it. I'm not talking about emotion. I'm talking about I got the good sense to know when the God that I serve steps into a moment, steps into a room, and steps into a situation. Hey! That's what just happened right there. When you talk about him, I said when you talk about him, he steps into a moment. When you talk about him, he steps into a room. You would be surprised what God would do for you if you quit talking about everybody else and start talking about him. Oh my goodness. Oh my, I ain't moving past this right here. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, can you hear him? Can you hear him? Can you hear him? He wants to be talked about. He wants to be praised. He wants to be lifted up. He wants to be glorified. Hey! See, see, the, see the thing is, the thing is, we, we, we can't be program-oriented to such a degree. I'm not talking about not having a plan. God, does, God is a God of strategy. God is a God of strategy. Write the vision. Make it plain. God is a God of strategy. But he that dwelleth in the secret place. Somebody asked me one time, where's the secret place? I said, it's a secret. And it's not just a secret one time, it's a secret every time. That's why it's called the secret place. Because see, if you could find it one time and God never moved it, it would no longer be a secret place. So God says, I want you seeking after me enough that if I move. God said, just listen. It's the secret place of the Most High. And, and um, it, it's, it's, it's important that, that we remind ourselves that, that the presence of God is like wind. The wind blows where it wants to blow. And, and we believe God for strategies and plans and wisdom and all of the things that he wants us to do. He expects us to use our smarts and our energies. He didn't expect us to be silly and not plan and all of those things. 
every so often and quite often, he'll just move a little bit to see who in the room can feel him and, and can be sensitive to where he's going because he always knows where he's leading. If you put those two things together and you have a place of presence and you already understand power, you would be amazed at what you can get done. I'm just going to tell you a couple more stories. There was, there was a young man, some of you remember, in our, in our teen group at that time, who had two large hearing aids because that's, that's the way he was born, and he couldn't, he couldn't hear well at all. And I was having uh, a healing service, and he came up, and I learned that if you can build an environment where the presence of God is at, it makes it easier for the power to do something. Yeah, this was a Sunday morning. So I prayed for him, and um, he took his hearing aids out. And um, so uh, we had a Sunday evening gathering that particular night. I can't remember exactly why. And he was walking in front of me about 10 or 15 feet. His name was Plaz. And, um, and so just to kind of test it out, I was about 10 feet behind him. I could see he didn't have his hearing aids in. And I said, hey, Plaz. And he just kept walking. I said, hey, Plaz. He goes, hey, I heard you the first time. <laughs> and God healed him that day. And uh, there was a family who since mo moved out of town, uh, but they, they, were, they were in the church. And um, this, what I'm talking about is if you have faith, I'm imparting something to you. I'm trying to impart to you the fact that if you have faith and if you can hear and if you can feel God, that's a gift to you. It helps you move mountains. And, um, and I had a prayer line around the front and I knew these people and, and the, the, the gentleman that I'm talking about had his, had his grandbaby who I'd never met. The grandbaby was three years old. I'd never met the, or two years old. I'd never met the grandbaby, but I, I had enough sense to know that's who that was. And I'm just praying for people. What I learned over the years is when the Spirit of God, in the presence of God, is hovering over you, I don't, it, it doesn't have to process through my mind. Out of your belly shall flow a river. I, I, don't, ha I, I don't have time to think about it. And I'm laying hands on people, and I prayed for them, and I went to the next person, and something turned me around. And I turned around like that, and I grabbed that baby, and I screamed, No! Just like that. Probably scared everybody just like I scared you just now. That's why you can't think about people. When you're doing what God gives you to do, you, you, you ain't got time to think about people. You got to do what you got to do. And I grabbed that child and I screamed, no! He came back the next week. He couldn't hardly talk. He could not talk. He told me, he said, what you don't know is he said, Our, that next Monday, the baby was, uh, baby I'm going to call it, toddler was set to go to the, the, the doctor because we came into the living room and it's sitting in front of the TV set and it's blasting. And he said, we started popping our hands, make a noise and realize it couldn't hear. Took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, this child is deaf. Next Monday, <laughs> next Monday, bring him in for a checkup. Something in me just screamed, no. He went home that afternoon and that baby's ears popped open. I'm, I'm looking for a Holy Ghost church. I said, I'm looking for a Holy Ghost church. I'm, I'm, see, I'm, I'm talking it out to you today because I, I don't want you to associate the move of God with a style. I don't want you to think I have to scream to get it done. Sometimes that's the way it works on me. You understand? But you, but it, 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 you don't have to have the organ to get it done. I, I, I love, I love it. Y'all know I love to preach like that. And I love all that. I love all the instruments. I love all the singers. I love all the band. I love all the lights. I love the mic. It don't take none of that. It helps us do it. I said it helps us do it. 
It helps us create a presence. It helps us to understand the things of God. But if you understand that if God puts power in your life uh, and you can hear God and you can feel God and you have some faith in your soul, the reason this is good news for you is because you don't live in this church building. I have won the biggest battles of my life with no choir in sight, with nobody to clap with me, with nobody to sing with me. But when you can say there is a name that is above every name and you can walk your floor and you can say, God, I thank you. God, I praise you. You can turn your car into a sanctuary. You can turn your office space into an outpouring of God. You can turn your bedroom into the holy of holies. You can turn it because the glory of God will come and go after those who are looking for him. We are coming into moments. Whew. We are coming into moments where you can no longer just go to a church and watch watch what's happening on the platform. I just heard something. I said, I just heard something. And what I heard was God is getting ready to release a mantle upon churches that will take the service away from people on the platform. When you get enough people in the building that can hear God, and feel God yeah. and have faith. Yeah. Somebody can be, it don't make nobody, it doesn't make anybody wrong. I'm just using people for an example. But we can say, oh, we're going from this song to the next song. But nobody in the church hears it. They're like, you, we ain't going nowhere. We're going to praise God right here till we get done praising God right here. And the anointing is going to move from here and start moving out here. Because the multitudes and the mountains and the mental mountains are getting ready to move to such a degree that we're not going to have time to lay hands on everybody every Sunday. So they're just going to get healed over there, back there. They're going to have a little healing revival while people over here is getting filled with the Holy Ghost, while somebody over here is getting a miracle, while somebody else over here is getting saved because somebody said, it's got to come into my direction. Jesus, stand still. you want something that gets beyond what man can do don't you want more than a cute sermon don't you want more than a than a nice rhythm on a song don't you want the presence of God to come in and say when God arises his enemies are scattered Somebody say, Lord, increase my faith. 
Lord, help me hear. Hallelujah. Lord, help me feel. It is, it's about time for some things to get a little out of control. I don't mean, I don't mean out of order. I don't mean silly. I mean, we, but, but I, I, I came to impart something today so that you know that we're a presence-oriented people. And we have a lot of teaching. Somebody did a, because we're doing all those documentary stuff, I think I've preached 10,000 messages in my life. So, yeah, well, amen. A <laughs> few of them was good, too. And, um, and the, the thing about it is, is the, the good thing about having 30-some years of experience in it and I, and I pray to God you don't take this wrong. Most of you know me well enough to know better than that. But I've, I've been able to preach on every platform I've ever wanted to preach on. And, and, I, and I thank God for that. But the good, the good part about that is I ain't looking for nothing else. I ain't trying to meet nobody else. I'm happy to meet whoever God wants me to meet. But I've met everybody I've ever wanted to meet. Met a whole lot of folks I wish to God I'd have never met. I've been every, every place, and, and, and I was sitting in South Africa last week, sitting there thinking how God has a way of taking you from one place. Whew. And God was giving me a, a glimpse. This is the way that I understood it. God said, I'm going to give everybody a glimpse of next season. And next season is blessing in the house. And you being able to go put gas, I call it, right? Gas in everybody's bus. And then come home and be a blessing to the house. But I, don't have to, I didn't have to worry about it. Don't have to think about it. Because our future is secure. And what, what people don't always understand is that progress is always a part of the life of the Spirit. Yeah. And you, you, you're always going to see me and Kathy because this is where we go to church. You understand? When, when, when our, our children were being raised, the way that we taught our family from the beginning is that we are first and foremost members of Cornerstone Church. We just have a unique role in the fact that we're leading it. And so that way our kids didn't grow up with entitlement. They didn't grow up trying to tell people what to do. And, and all of us serve and volunteer and do, do whatever it is that, that, that we need to do. So, so that's the way we feel. That's the way we need to feel. But, but I'm, because Kathy and I started so young, our peers are older than us. I mean, if you start thinking about people who have been in ministry for 35 years, most of our peers are older than us. So we were, we were always kind of like first out there. Like we were the first of our peers especially at our age, to be like in a building program or to have a thousand members or to go to certain places. We, we were some of the first. So now I'm having, I'm having people everywhere tell me we're watching from a distance the way that your church family and you guys are working this thing out properly so that the future of the church is secured and you don't have to be disconnected from it. Because some of our peers, and I'm not going to call anybody's name, but some of our peers are, are wishing that they had thought about it because now they're up in their 70s and the church has lost its life and they don't have anybody coming in behind them and they don't know what to do. We, 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 we built this church to be a mountain-moving city, shaking, multi-generational. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. Y'all better sit down. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I get myself stirred up. I get myself stirred up. And, and to see how, how God is maneuvering us. Let me, let me do this last one because you have to have power. You have to have power, but don't, don't go after power and forsake the presence. And so then when you get the presence, 
The last one I'm going to do, just to keep my alliteration again, is, is the prosper part. I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So don't confuse prosperity with stuff, okay? Because you can have a lot of stuff and be ready to take your own life. Prosperity is not cash, Cadillacs, credit cards, cabin cruisers, and condominiums. Prosperity is the help of God. It's the help of God that gives you peace in a storm. If you're a nervous wreck, you can go out and buy an expensive suit, sir, and be a nervous wreck looking nice. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I want to say that because Paul says, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. I'm praying this prayer that you will prosper. Everybody say progress. progress. Yeah, that you will progress, that you will progress, that you will progress and be in health. Be well. Be at peace. Be free of anxieties as much as you can. Be free of anxiety and all of that tension. Nerv nervous about stuff you can't fix. You ever get so tense about something until then you realize when you let your shoulders down, you're like, oh, I need a massage. You need a prayer line and then a massage. <laughs> and um, that, that you prosper, that you prosper. So our prayer is always that, that we prosper and that you prosper. And that what God has called us to do, that we prosper in it. The power, the presence, and the ability to prosper. When, um, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are numbers of, of people that have not been here that long. But years ago, we started when we talked about our New Year's Eve service. And um, I had this, this word that came to me that it went like this. One deal, one door, one decision in one day could bring it all back. Y'all remember all that? Y'all have heard it for so many years. And, um, but the kind of the way that I function is if I hear something, I speak it out. And so I, I spoke it out and, and put out a challenge that on New Year's that people would sow a thousand dollar offering. I just said it because, I, because I've learned not to, not to be thinking about people because people have mental mountains. And some people have multitude mountains, and some people have money mountains. I'm always very careful not to pressure people when it comes to that, because I don't think that that does any good. But I'm also, as, as you should know, since I'm a faith guy, I'm very concerned not to build a house of excuses, not to give you a bunch of excuses why not to stretch your faith. Doesn't mean that everybody can do it, but every year, hundreds of people do it. Hundreds of people do it. So... So I, w I, was, I was thinking about the fact that $1,000 is, is like a barrier-breaking offering. You understand that? It's like a barrier-breaking offering. Because you don't hardly hear anybody ever can, you know, er everybody thinks if you go to church, throw in a 20, text in a 50-something. But when you, when you start talking about that, that level to many people, then that becomes a barrier-breaking gift. Because what I found out is that if it's too big to send out, it's too big to call in. So the centurion said, I say to one, go, and he goes. To another one, come, and he comes. That means whatever I have the authority to, go, to say go, I have the authority to call in. Let me tell you, $1,000 was a barrier breaking for us. Um, I saw my parents sitting up in the balcony today. We started our church with no, Kathy and I didn't have anything to start it with. And my parents gave us a $1,000 seed. Look around you right now. You never know what's in this seed. You never know what's in it. We, we wouldn't have been able to do it unless somebody helped us. And, and numbers of you have be, either been in or been by 
our storefront on Central and Douglas, where we started at. And we had to believe, I'm telling you, we had to believe God every month to make that rent. We started with 30 people. I preached so hard. Next week we have 15. <laughs> and I preached so hard, the next week we had seven. And my brother said to me, he goes, by my figures, about two more weeks, we can shut this bad boy down. <laughs> but I just kept on preaching, and people started coming. But we had to believe God every week. And I, th I, think, I think the, I think our, I can't remember exactly, Kathy, but it was like, $2,100, $2,500, it was like in the $2,500 was the rent for that building. But you don't know, we was, we was kids. And, and we had people coming and going and, you know, they looking at me like, we don't know if you're going to make it. And, and, and I'm looking at them like, well, I don't know if you're going to make it either, but we, you know. And so, but that's what, that's what we did. Oh, because, because somebody sold $1,000. Right. So we're in there believing God that we're going to move from there and go over to the Burn Hill Plaza. And so we believe in God to, to make rent. We believe in God to, for every, I mean, every little thing, you know, every little thing. But when, you, but when you have faith and you can hear God and you can feel God, you should count it as a gift. And um, so we're just believing. And um, so, so one week, this was the first time anybody ever gave $1,000 other than my parents at Cornerstone Church. So we, we were just up against this little cash crunch kind of a thing. We're trying to get to where we're going. And I didn't know how to do it, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And one of the, uh, uh, a lady in the church, she came up and she put a check in my hand for $1,000. And after I got up off the floor, <laughs> I was really excited because, because, I mean, we was needing it. So I went back to take it to, to, to them that were processing offerings and that. And I went back there and I heard the Lord say, go give it back. Yeah. And I was like, no, that ain't God. That ain't God. God, ain't even, no, God ain't even in the vicinity. Loose here, devil. Let God's people go. But, but I heard it, and then the way it came to me was her husband does not come. And then I realized what God was saying to me was like, what if she gives that? And then that causes her husband to be angry or, you know, something like that. And so I walked back out there, and I handed it to her. And I said, I need to give this back to you. I said, because I'm praying for your husband to come and get saved. And I said, I wouldn't want, I said, his soul is worth so much more than, than $1,000. I said, just, just take it back. So she was holding it in her hand, and she says to me, no, he's the one that told me to write it. I said, give it back then. Let God be praised. God was just testing me. Did you hear me? I said, God was just testing me to see if I would listen. But if you can hear and you have faith. And, and her husband came and got saved and owned an uh, excavating thing and built these parking lots around here for us. Brought his bulldozers out here. Y'all not hearing nothing from me. I'm telling you, you don't know what's in a seed. And so sometimes it's just at that level that breaks, that breaks a barrier. So when, when, when the church was moving uh, towards Airport Highway, Kathy and I had our, our first house, and we liked it. had a little pool in it. And we were so excited. had a house. And so we, we was asking everybody to give something, you know, to go to the, uh, to the next level in the church. And we were asking everybody to do something. And so we had come up with a figure in our mind as to what we wanted to give. And then... When we got looking at it, we didn't have what it took to give it. So me, I come home, and I said to Kathy, we are ready to sell this house and all our furniture, and we're going to give what we want to give. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> How many of you ladies just felt like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and and um, 
And so um, Kathy's always been great with me like this. So she give me a little time. I'm like, amen. <laughs> and then she says, um, she says, if, if you feel like we need to sell the house to do that and God is in that, then let's sell the house. She said, but wherever we live, we got to have some furniture. And so if you sell all the furniture and we get another place, then we still got to go buy furniture. So I was like, good point. <laughs> so, so, so we sold the house and we didn't feel bad about it. I'm not, I have never asked anybody, I'm, I'm not asking anybody to do that right now. I would recommend don't do it unless God tells you to do it. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't playing that little game. But, but that, that's what we wanted to do because that's, 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 that's us. And so then we moved, um, we had two kids and a big dog over to these apartments that you, well, you remember Southwick Mall used to be right down here. Then across the way from Southwick Mall, we moved two kids and a big dog into a little apartment and we were just as happy as we could be. But we were able to sew it because it broke certain barriers for us to do. I have found out that there is an ability to break barriers. And so, so when I came in uh, this morning, I'm, I'm, when I came in this morning, and don't, don't play anything because I, I don't want any kind of anything other than what I'm doing right now. And the, when I came in this morning, I wanted to remind you that we are barrier breakers. Amen. And um, so the way that I heard it was that this, that this offering in New Year's, between now and New Year's or New Year's, is going to be an offering that breaks barriers, Amen. that shatters ceilings, right. and that lifts limitations. Right. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. So when, when Kathy and I were talking, I was telling her, I said, I said, what we're going to do coming into 2020 is we're going to, since it's a year of double, we're going to double ours. We're going to give 2020. And I know that there's a handful of people that would join with us in doing that and all, all that kind of thing. But you have to have that in your heart to do. You have to have to be able to hear it, to feel it, have the faith for it, to be able to move certain mountains to do that. But, but what I wanted to do today, I asked the, um, the team back here just to put on the envelope those three things um, that says barrier breaking, Ceiling shattering, limitation lifting. Because what I want to do is I want to put one of these in the hands of people that feel like you're going to join in a barrier breaking offering at a thousand dollar level. Some of you, every year people do, some people of means do more than that. Some people are going to join with Kathy and I and do double for your trouble, whatever. And, um, and I know many of you will give on your app or you give in other ways, but what I want to do is just put this in your hand no matter how you're going to give it, whether you give it now or you're going to give it later, because what I would like for you to do is to, just to put this someplace. And if you're going to give on your app, then you don't have to put it in here or whatever. Stick it on your refrigerator. Put it on a mirror. Put it in your wallet, purse, where, whatever you have to do with it. And just start from now until first of the year saying over yourself, I am breaking barriers. I am shattering ceilings. And I am lifting limitations over my life. Over my life. All right. Can you bring those out here? If you're going to be one of those people, just come down here and let me put one into your hand. And um, I just want to do it just like this right here before I, before I start making prayers and things like that. This is a... Can you just undo that for me, please? This is like a, uh, an impartation. How many are getting an impartation today? Getting an impartation. Um, yeah. Yeah, Meredith can help me. And Ed can help me. Hi, guys. You remember all them storefronts. You guys just had an anniversary too, right? Yes. What year? 41. 41. Still smiling. <laughs> Still good. See, and she said all three generations are here in church. You, you help them, Kath? Okay. Yep. I'm just going to, we're just going to walk out here and hand them. And um, 
I'm not having a bunch of music or a bunch of hoopla because I don't want somebody with a, a mental mountain, hey Danny, a mental mountain to get shaken up and have an earthquake. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, my friend. Good to see you. God bless you. Hey, dear. God bless you. Bless you. Everybody say barrier breaking. Ceiling shattering. Ceiling shattering. Limitation lifting. Limitation see, lifting. this is the cool thing. I got to see. Uh, I got to see him yes. on video being baptized during the worship night. Did you see him? He tried to go viral, but I wouldn't let it. All right, there you go. Good to see you. God bless you. Hi. God bless you. Bless you. Hi, dear. God bless you. Good. I love you too. God bless you. Hey, man, if you want to? All right. Bless you. Say hi to Jim and Sue. Okay. Hey, bless you. Hey, man. How are you? Good. Hi, young lady. Hey, lip too. There you go. There you go. Hi. How you doing? God bless you. Bless you. Hey, Pastor Banks. Pastor Banks is going to be preaching some in Michigan this, uh, at our Cornerstone campus here pretty soon. Hi. I'm going to, have you guys been here very often? Uh, no. No? It's good to see you. When I was younger, I'm uh, stationed in Germany. You're stationed in Germany. Everybody point your hands up towards this young man. We bless you. Bless your family. Bless all of you. You are a barrier breaker. You are a mountain mover. You are a game changer. In the name of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you, young man. God bless you. God bless you. I'm just taking a few moments here. I'm going to pray for, pray for a few other things here in just a minute. I was, I was at a place the other day um, just since I've been home because when I got home, I was on Africa time. Pastor Kathy did an awesome job teaching on Thursday. She knows how to teach it up. I told her, I said, just give me a couple days because I was there for almost three weeks. And so, you know, the time zone, you know how jet lag does on you. So, so um so I was at a, a place here in town the other day, and um, it was all kind of people in there that said to me, I used to come to Cornerstone when I was little, or my aunt brought me, my granddad brought me, and uh, anytime I need to feel the spirit or do something for God, then I, then I get there. And I said, well, you should just get there, you know? So I'm believing God's calling all of them. All right, Alan, just give me a little bit of something here, because here's what I want to do. E-flat is what I want to do is, um, is there are people here today, people here today that are not where you should be with God. All of the stuff that I talked about doesn't mean anything if you don't start the journey. Starting your journey has nothing to do with, with us taking care of our faith offerings or things like that. I don't want you to mix the two. I don't want you to mix the two. I don't, being saved, is not what you have done for God. It's what he has already done for you. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Because you, money couldn't pay it. Nothing could pay it. Only Jesus could pay it all. And you're in this building today, maybe sitting in the back row of the balcony, or the front row of the balcony, maybe front row of the choir, maybe wearing a nice usher outfit or who knows where you may be? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you look like to other people. It matters whether you can leave this place today knowing that you and God are in the right place. And he's already opened up the door. All you have to do is walk through it. And these are the days. And you'll discover your purpose. You don't have to come up with your purpose. All you have to do is discover it. God has brought you to the kingdom to be a part of a generation that will serve him and lift up his name in the earth and to, and to see this world turned upside down and see mountains that have plagued other generations to see them move and get out of the way and you say I'm in this building today Bishop and when you when you pray the prayer would you include me in that prayer because I'm one of those people that Maybe you knew God when you were a child, and maybe somebody took you to vacation Bible school, or maybe somebody gave you a, 
they used to give us those little zip up Bibles when you're young. They zip all the way around. They got pretty pictures on the inside of them. And all. Maybe you had all that kind of a thing and did communion and were christened and all the kind of different stuff. But you say the truth is I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not serving God. Haven't been serving God. But I'm here today. When you pray that prayer, include me in that prayer because today I'm ready to admit he's God. I'm not. He's holy. I'm not. He came to help. He came to reach me because I couldn't reach him. And you say, I'm one of those people. Right now, throw your hands straight up in the air, wherever you may be, all over this building. And we're going to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you, young lady. God bless you over here. God bless you over here. It's just a nice moment right here, right now. If your hand is up, would you just jump up real quick? Just jump up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to point you out to everybody. And I see this young man way back here. God bless you. Just keep standing up wherever you, wherever you may be. God bless you, young lady. I'm so glad for you. The reason, God bless you, young man. I'm just going to this side of the balcony now because I don't want you, I don't believe everybody on this side of the balcony is saved. I just, I don't know. I, I, I haven't, there you go. See, she jumped up there. I've been, don't make me come up there because, you know, I'm just, I just didn't get that vibe from this during the service like everybody up here is saved you know I just I'm not sure about all that God bless you I'm just having a little bit of fun with you God bless you sir God bless you sir God bless you sir God bless you I see people are just it's like popcorn it's just coming up the thing about it is you should never underestimate what happens when a person receives Christ and that's why you have to be easy with, with some people, you know, because most people's, the, the people that become targets are people whose problems are visible. Other people have problems too. You just can't see it so easy. And so most of what happens is the growth goes underground before it comes up. And the, and the main thing is we learn how to live and serve God together, okay? So how, how can we do this? Who's over this? Is Glenn, are you over this? And, and Mr. Banks? Okay, so let's run. You might want to get some help. I want everyone standing up to have one of these cards and whatever comes with that. Do we have like a little booklet for them? Yep. They're just going to bring you one of these so that, that way when we get done praying. There's a young man way back here. Everybody happy today? It's just 12.07. Yep. The Lord is good and his love endures. Yes, the Lord is good forever. And I'll shout it out. Shout it out, and I'll shout it out from the mountain top. Yes, the Lord is good for. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm getting ready to pray. Hey, Phil, can can we see um, something? Let me see one, like something that we have in the bookstore that we can give to everybody here, whether it's a music or a book or something. And grab me about ten or twenty of them. That way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give everybody something so that they remember. Sometimes, if you get something, you remember the day that you got saved. You remember that. Okay, so let's 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 pray this prayer. Let's pray, pray this prayer. Everybody in the building, let's pray it together so that the people that are praying don't feel like they're praying it by themselves. All right, dear God, dear God I, come to you now, I come to you now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus name. I don't claim to be a great person. I don't claim to have lived a great life. I am a sinner. 
I have faith. I have faith. Thank, you for it. Thank you for it. I believe, I believe. Jesus, died Jesus died for me and rose on the third day. Come into my heart. Save me. Save me. Change, me. Change me. Make me a child of God. Me a child of God. And, I will serve you and I will serve you as you show me how. Show me how. Amen. Amen. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Amen. What do we have here? Oh, good. Yep. Um, yeah, you can just stand right here. So we have, um, a heal the, uh, we have a, either a Heal the World CD music thing or... Uh, Fault lines, book right there, all right? So those of you that filled out that card, um, then when this service is, is coming to the end here, just bring it up here and we'll give you something for it. That way we have a chance to catch up with you and get you all signed up. Now, if you've been a member for 20 years, don't fill out no card and come walking up on me. Because <laughs> I know how y'all do. I know how y'all do. So... Anyway, so uh, this Thursday is going to be something. All right, so let's, let's do this right here. Um, let's, everybody, let's get ready to give right here, right now. And we're going to let these people kind of walk this way here in just a minute. And so if you're giving on your app, then do that. And um, everybody get your phone out. And the rest of us, we're going to give on this thing. Oh, I brought an offering here. I got to get an envelope. So what I'm going to do this, this year is that um, right after, sometime shortly after the first of the year, um, those that participate in our barrier breaking offering, then we're gonna put a little thing together at the downtown location, and I'm gonna show you the whole, doc, the whole half hour documentary. That'll be like a little fun thing to do. And uh, then we're gonna figure out how we're doing. Yeah, good, come on down. You helping us out? Come on. What's your name, sir? What's your name? Keith Skinner. Keith, good to see you. God bless you. Welcome home. Welcome home. Meredith, are you helping us over here? Thank you. Who, if, you, if you fill out your card, then just come on, bring it up here. Mary's going to do it. I need an envelope because I'm, thank you. Glory to God, I'm feeling good today. Thursday is going to be wild. We're going we're gonna to put some, we're going to put some pressure on the devil. Hello, young man. Tell me your name. Joseph. Joseph. Right there you go. Let's say amen for Joseph. Can you just write my name on that? All right, let's just help us out right here. You know what I was thinking of today? That's why I was saying go to E flat. I was thinking of a walk on the water with me. <laughs> walk on the water with me. You will not fail. You will not fail. Everybody say walk, walk on the water with me, walk on the water with me, you will not fail, you will not fail. Amen. Good to see you. Yes, sir. Walk on the water. Eddie Combs is in the house. Sing a little bit. Walk on the water with me. Come on and walk on the water with me You will not fail You will not fail
come on and walk on the water with me You will not fail You will not fail Come on, put your hands together, everybody in the house today How many are glad you came to God's house today? Aren't you glad? I said, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Somebody say, I am a mountain mover. I am a barrier breaker. I am a history maker. I am a history maker. I'm a news maker. I'm a game changer. And the devil's in trouble. God bless you, everybody. We love you. Thursday night's going to be awesome. Love somebody. Glad to see you, okay? God bless you. Hey church family, thanks for sticking around as we go a little bit deeper into today's service together. It's something exclusive that we want to make available for our online family. So thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in for all of service. We believe that God is not done with this service yet because we've got Chris Leary who's going to be sharing a little bit about your trip from the Bahamas. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, if you didn't know, Cornerstone Church is part of our Cornerstone Global Network and we just sent a team to the Bahamas to respond to Hurricane Dorian. Before we talk about that though, let's talk about service. What'd you get out of today's service? Today's service, I loved. I love the concept of being a mountain mover and I love the practical day-to-day life of a spirit walk um, through being a mountain mover in that sense. And I just love hearing Bishop and all his stories and he's walked through so many things that to be able to sit and learn from him and learn from what he's walked through in his life is yeah. just an incredible thing. Yeah, and I love those three P's to be remembering, that to be a mountain mover, it requires power, presence, and prosperity. Those three things in partnership together and uh, allow us to be a mountain mover. And it's really one of the things that I care so greatly about for our online family is that you feel the presence of God and that you feel our presence here from Cornerstone Church with you as well, that you don't feel isolated in whatever environment or situation that you might be joining in today. It's our heart that there can be a great sense of engagement, that you can feel it when we're praying for you, that you can feel a conversation when we're engaging with you, and that you feel that you are here with us as well every time that we gather together corporately. It's our heart that uh, that there is no distance or device that separates you. Now, you were just with some of our Cornerstone Global Network family. Yes, Tell was. us what happened in the Bahamas. What was it like? What did you experience? In the Bahamas, it was fantastic. We took a team of 12 people from four different states. So we had a little bit of everyone from Michigan, from Ohio, from California, and from Virginia. And we were able to go down. We worked on four different houses. We replaced roofing. We took out walls, took out mold, um, put some new walls in, and we were able to really restore a couple homes to families there who had lost those and um, were unable to live in their houses. So it was a fantastic experience to be able to just sit and talk with them and see uh, what the physical work can do um, to restore even emotionally and spiritually to people. Now, being a mountain, you went away and you've come back into a series that we've been calling being a mountain mover, that I am a mountain mover. What does that do for your faith um, to to see the work that's going on in other communities? Uh, And what does that do to see what God is doing in other communities? Well, actually, um, it's a little bit hard sometimes to go into places like that because you see there's an entire country here that's been destroyed for the most part and we have a team of 12 people we're here for a week what can we do in the face of all of that destruction um and it's being a mountain mover to me it's something that's been in my head a lot just listening to these uh services listening to the sermons and going to the bahamas there was a book that i read a couple months ago and with part of it she was talking about how in haiti there was a land where they wanted to build a school and they couldn't build a school there because there was this little, it was like a hill, a small mountain of rocks in the middle of this clearing where they needed to build a school. And they couldn't build it there because the ground wasn't flat enough and there was nothing they could do. Um, And there was this man who came in and started to move this hill that was in the middle of the clearing, one stone at a time. Mm -hmm. And it took him years to do, but there's a school that stands there now today. And so to look at that, to look at what we did in the Bahamas, even just four houses in the face of an entire country, um, to be able to go in and start moving small stones. Sometimes we think of mountain moving, I think, as this one big, great act, and we do one thing and suddenly everything changes. Um, But more often than not, 
what I'm seeing more and more in going and in listening is that it's years and it's days and weeks of showing up consistently and just moving one piece at a time yeah. until that mountain is moved. Yeah, I love that. It reminds me of one of my favorite stories, one of Aesop's fables, where it talks about there being this pitcher in the middle of a desert that's just got a little bit of water at the bottom in this pitcher and there's a bird that's trying to get to the water and it can't get all the way inside. And so what it realizes is if I take a pebble and I drop it inside that pitcher, then the water level raises just a little bit. And then it goes and grabs another pebble and then it puts it in and it grabs another pebble and puts it in. And then eventually the water level rises to the point where it can now drink some of the water. It speaks to that idea that consistency is what brings success and that it is perseverance that brings change. And so being a mountain mover isn't necessarily about one big moment of being a mountain mover, but it's about consistency and making sure that you show up time and time again where you will see the breakthrough. When you show up in your kids' lives, when you show up in your family's lives, when you're consistently praying for those in your neighborhood, when you're investing in your neighbor's lives, right next to you, you've got people that need to know Jesus. And it might be one conversation that changes everything, or it might be the fact that every single day you show up and you wave and you say, God bless you. Is there anything that I can be doing for you serving the people in our neighborhood? We are believing that it is through consistency and perseverance and showing the love of God on a daily basis that great things will happen. Absolutely. Yeah. It takes all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, I know that there were many people that were asking about how you can participate in New Year's Eve and what's going on for our online family for New Year's Eve. You are not forgotten. We have something special for you as well. In fact, all of our, the entire service is going to be streamed online for our online family. And if you want more information about what the One Deal, One Door, One Decision offering is all about, you can simply go to cornerstone.church slash NYE slash NYE. That's New Year's Eve. You can find out more information about the history of where that word came from, from God for Bishop and how it applies to all of us today. There's more information about how you can make, you can make your commitment as well for that thousand dollar seed for our New Year's Eve offering. It's going to be a great time for those who are able to join us here if you're in this local community or for those that are joining all over the world as well. We are believing that when you start your 2020 right, it's going to set you up in a great trajectory for great things to come. We know that your 2020 is Brad, you're getting ready to head off to Australia. You excited about that? So excited. Yeah, for getting Bible ready. college and all of those kind of good things. We believe that your future is brighter than your past. We believe that your tomorrow is better than your yesterday. And we are believing that and speaking these words over you today. We would love to see you back here on Thursday night for a continuation of to the, today's word. Until then, God bless. Bye for now.